Welcome to Public Domain Video Theater presented by the great detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. Well, today we're going to bring you an episode of The Court of Last Resort. Uh, this one is uh, Season 1, Episode 19, and the title is The Frank Clark Case, Original Air Date, February 21st, 1958. According to the case for the prosecution, this is what happened in one of the large Atlantic seaboard cities at 2.25 in the afternoon of June the 9th, 1956. Nice hot afternoon, huh? Mm. Well, you're home early today. Banker's hour, huh? Yeah. Captain Cunningham. You see him? All right, which one is it? Just put your hand on the shoulder. That's the man you saw jump across the fence and run through your yard. Yes, absolutely. This man, Frank Clark, was indicted, tried, and convicted of murder. He was sentenced to 99 years in the state penitentiary. But was he guilty? He swore he was not. Though Frank Clark started serving his term, others worked in his behalf. His attorney, claiming the evidence was insufficient to convict, carried an appeal to the highest court in the state. His family, claiming he was innocent of the crime, fought hard, but got nowhere. Then they turned to the court of last resort. Court of last resort is actually at work today, investigating cases throughout the United States. Its board of investigators, a group of seven men, experts in law and criminology, bound together in their dedication to improving the administration of justice. to determine whether there had been a miscarriage of justice in this case, the court of last resort sent me to investigate. Mrs. Farrell? Mr. Lawson? Yes, ma'am. Come in. Thank you. Boy, it is hot. Mm -hmm. Here, let me take your jacket. Oh, thanks. I certainly am glad to see you. You don't know how long it's been that I've been trying to get somebody to do something about this. Now, well, Mrs. Farrell, I can't promise you that we can do anything. You've got to keep in mind that your brother's case was appealed to the state Supreme Court, and they affirmed his conviction. I don't care what they did. He didn't kill anybody. He was right here when it happened. He was right here in this apartment. Roberta, who was it, Ed? Yeah. That's my husband. We were just going to have our coffee. Oh, I'm sorry if I disturbed your dinner. Not at all. He just came home late today. You have coffee with us. All right. Paul, this is Mr. Larson from the Court of Last Resort. Glad to know you, Mr. Larson. 
Carol. You sit right down here, and, and I'll go and get the coffee. Mr. Lawson, before you do anything for Frank, I'd like to know what this is all about. What I mean is, how much is it going to cost? Well, I've had it with the expense of lawyers, appeals, and everything. It didn't help. We don't accept any payment for our work, Mr. Farrell. Well, that's good, because I wouldn't pay out any more for him. I've had it with him. Sure. You can stand there and let him rot in a penitentiary because you've had it with him. Okay. He can spend the rest of his life behind bars, but you don't care. It costs you a little money. All right. You've had it with him. I said all right, didn't I? Sure. He was in a little trouble before. A little trouble? He was away four years. Well, that's why the police picked on him. Find someone who's been in trouble, they said. If he could do that, they said, then he could do this. Well, my brother never killed anyone. He couldn't have. He wouldn't. He was right here when it happened. Right here. I read your testimony. Well, I told them. I was homesick that day, and Paul was at work. You remember, Paul? Frank came in around one o'clock. He gave me some ginger ale. I just couldn't eat anything. And then he came into the living room, and he watched television, a ball game, a doubleheader. And about five o'clock, he went to work. He worked as a machinist in an electronics plant then. Why didn't they believe me? Don't I look like I'm an honest woman, like I tell the truth? Juries are usually reluctant to accept the testimony of an interested party, especially in the face of the other evidence. Well, what other evidence? You mean that woman, that neighbor? She said she saw somebody cross her yard in two seconds, two seconds, and she says it was Frank. Now, how could she recognize it? We have some good cake. Would you like some? It's from a good bakery. No, no, thanks. The police were just against him, that's all. I don't know why. He's a fine boy and good-looking, too. Would you like to see a picture of him? Roberta, I would, yes. You'll see. I don't... It's like a compulsion with this boy. Boy. She keeps calling him a boy. He's almost 30 years old. But he is her younger brother, Mr. Farrell. You hit the nail right on the head, Mr. She feels a responsibility for this. Her father, well, he liked the bottle. And her mother, she never came home, if you know what I mean. So the kids never had much of a home. But Berta, she couldn't stand it. She got out as fast as she could. She got married, she was 17. Frank remained, of course. Well, I guess she always had a conscience about this. So when he first got into trouble, she felt it was her fault. Now with this... She has a determination. Nothing can stop her. So you see what I got to contend with. What about the conflict between her testimony and the other evidence? Look, Mr. Lawson, personally, I don't care whether Frank stays in or out or what. But my wife, she isn't a good liar. No, she don't lie. She said that Frank was here that afternoon. He was here, period. Here are some pictures of him. You'll see what a good-looking boy he is. The next morning, I made an appointment to see Captain Edward P.J. Cunningham, commanding officer of the Homicide Squad, the man who had charge of the investigation which resulted in the arrest and conviction of Frank Clark for murder. Mr. Lawson? Yes. Captain, come in. Thank you. Sit down, Mr. Lawson. Thank you, sir. Ah, this is the most murderous weather. Yeah, sorry to keep you waiting. It's all right. Now, before we get started, Mr. Larson, I just want you to know this. Frank Clark killed that old man. As far as I'm concerned, he's lucky he didn't get the electric chair. I'm not saying he didn't, Captain. We just think there's enough in it to make it worth another good look. All right. I just want you to understand what my position is. Okay. Now, what can I do to help you? Well, now, I understand that the, uh, the dead man, Luchanik... Had withdrawn $200 from bank that day. Did you ever find it? Nothing in Clark's room. Nothing on him. And the weapon? We got out his toolbox at the shop. There it was. A screwdriver about this long. It was clean. Everything else in the toolbox had that oil scum. You know how tools get. So we brought it in, had the lab take a look at it. It was washed with water and carbon tet. But there were still traces of blood on it. Plus the fact that the jimmy marks were made by an identical screwdriver. Our lab technician testified that, in his opinion, the screwdriver was used to open the door and kill the man. And most important, the identifying witness? Yes, Mrs. Stacy. This gal was so sure of herself, she didn't hesitate a minute. She made him in the lineup like that. No doubt in her mind. Yeah. She sounds almost a little too positive, Captain. Listen, what'll make you fellas happy anyway? 
You scream when an eyewitness hesitates in making an identification. You scream when they're sure of themselves. I'm not screaming. I'm just asking. Oh, she saw him in the yard. She saw him in the lineup. She made him. All right. Well, what about the sister's story? That he was there all afternoon in the apartment watching a ball game on television. Well, she loves her brother. Well, she swore he was there. Oh, he might have been earlier in the afternoon. So she stretched the time a little bit. You want to look over our reports? If you don't mind, Captain. Help yourself. Anything you want. But I'll tell you something, Mr. Larson. Bill, bring in that file on Frank Clark, will you? I got 26 years in the job. At this stage of the game, another homicide cleared by arrest doesn't mean a thing on my departmental record. I got him to give away. Oh, I don't want to see anybody hooked for something they didn't do. Take my word for it. Frank Clark killed that man. There's no doubt about it whatsoever. That afternoon, I drove up to the state prison for my first interview with Frank Clark. Frank, I'm Sam Larson from the Court of Last Resort. Yeah, my sister wrote. First, I want to tell you that this is just a preliminary investigation. I don't know whether there's a thing we can do for you. Well, now, you don't have to worry about me, Mr. Larson. A guy who was born with two strikes against him like me, he doesn't... He doesn't look for breaks. Anything you can do, I'll appreciate. But, but I'm not expecting anything, so if nothing happens, it's all right, too. Well, now, your sister seems to have the feeling that the police were out to get you. No, not the police. Cunningham. Why Cunningham? Well, he's a, he's a big man with a record, Cunningham. See, he, he jobs me. He gets rid of an ex-con, and he ties up a fast conviction for that big, shiny record of his. But if you were clean, how did he get evidence on you? Oh, easy. They frame me in the screwdriver. They go to my toolbox and get one that looks good, and then they clean it up to make it look as if I removed the blood. Oh, no, Frank. You'd have to... You'd have to have more than that to prove that you were framed. You looking for a hook? I think you should see what's behind Mrs. Stacy. Why her? Well, I mean... What does she want to stand up there for and say that it was me she, she saw coming over the fence when she knows it wasn't? There must be some reason... You know what I think it is? What's that? I think that there was some connection between her and the old man, besides being just neighbors. If anybody knew we had money in the house, she did. Maybe. What I think is that she figured to put the make in somebody. And Cunningham gave her a, gave her a line on me, knowing I'd be an easy pigeon for him. Shortly after I left the prison, I reported by phone to the board of the Court of Last Resort. They decided that if Frank Clark was innocent, the best way to prove it was to trace the real killer. Then I drove back to town for another talk with Captain Cunningham. I can't tell what's in the woman's mind, Mr. Larson. She says that Clark is the man who came over the fence, and she's firm about it. And what's more, I believe she's right. How did she and Lieutenant get along? Oh, come on, Mr. Larson. No, I mean, was there any relationship between them besides just being neighbors? You're grabbing at straws. Well, no, he was a widower, she was a divorcee, it's possible. Also, he had money, she had none. Now, even if she wasn't interested in him, she could have been interested in his money. I can just picture those dainty hands putting that screwdriver into him not once, but twice. No, I don't say that, but I do say that it's possible that she knows more about this than she said. You're still grabbing, Mr. Larson. Well, now, wait a minute. You said that you wanted to hold the line up the next morning after Clark's arrest. But that she begged off until the afternoon. Now, what reason did she give? People have their own lives to lead. If you want a helpful witness, you've got to be considerate. All right. Thanks, Captain. Sorry to trouble you again. No trouble at all, Mr. Larson. I told you, anything you want. Thank you. Of course, the uh, lines were out and the yard was full of wash, but I saw them. Well, I got a good look at him. I wish you'd tell me why you're starting this whole thing up again. I don't mind talking to you, but uh, I'd like to know. We just think it's worth additional investigation. Well, I don't see why. I saw that Frank Clark come over the fence. It was him. Mrs. Stacy, I want to ask you a rather personal question. I hope you won't be offended. Well, uh, that depends how personal. Do you drink? No, uh... I enjoy a highball occasionally. Well, 
You know, after all, I'm a woman alone. I uh, go out on dates. I enjoy a, a social drink occasionally. Uh-huh. Oh, I don't see what that's got to do with it. If I take a drink once in a while. Mr. Lechenik was killed about 2.30 in the afternoon. 2.25. And Frank Clark was arrested that same night. But you didn't go to the police station to see him in the lineup till about 1 o'clock the next afternoon. That's right. <laughs> but I still don't see what it has to do with whether I take a drink occasionally. Well, now, we know that you were busy with the detectives that afternoon and part of the evening after the murder. But supposing I were to tell you that there's a sworn statement by a man who says that he saw you the next day from about 9.30 in the morning to 1 o'clock in the afternoon in a bar. That's a lie. That you were drinking steadily and that you were incapable of making a proper identification. I never heard anything so ridiculous in my life. <laughs> Look, I don't go to bars. And I don't drink in the daytime, ever. Well... <laughs> Sure like to know who told you that. Can you imagine that? Well, it must have been a friend of his. That's Frank Clark, so I like that. Can you account for your time that morning, Mrs. Stacy? Well, of course I can account for my time. I was downtown. Where downtown? Because I'd like to check it. No, I I had a couple of errands. Did you talk to anyone in particular? Of course. Who? I remember I went to the... Uh... You went where? To the uh, finance company and made a payment on my car. What finance company was that? The Modern. And after that, I had coffee with a friend of mine uh, about 11 o'clock. She wanted to hear about all the excitement. Uh-huh. Whoever told you that about my being in a bar and being drunk was a, was a lie. You're just a plain liar, that's all. Well, you know how it is, Mrs. Stacy. We have to check everything. Well, yeah, I suppose so. Honest to goodness, do you have to take these lies seriously? We have to find out. Thank you. I remember Mrs. Stacy very well, Mr. Larson. We had a lot of trouble with her. She was very slow. Consistently slow? Consistently. Her alimony checks were always late. That seemed to be the main excuse she relied on. But she was in here on the morning of June the 10th. Yes, yes, yes. I had called her twice that week. Told her we were going to repossess her car. She was behind in two installments. What did she pay that day? Well, that surprised me. I thought she would be ready with more excuses. But instead, she made the two payments in cash. How much was it? $93.10 each, plus a penalty of $11.07 for a total of $197.27. In cash? Yes, sir. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mitchell. Oh, well, if it's about my being in a bar and being drunk, it's a lie. You know I wasn't drunk that day. I'm never drunk. Oh, uh, won't you sit down? It's, it's much cooler out here. Thanks. I checked your story, Mrs. Stacy. Found that you were down at the finance company, as you said. Which brings up another point. Well, what kind of point? Well, where did you get the hundred and ninety-seven dollars? Well, it was my money. Well, if it was your money, where did you get it? I had it. You were two months late in your payments. You were about to repossess your car. Suddenly, you show up with hundred and ninety-seven dollars. And where'd you get the money? Oh. Uh... It was my back alimony. It came through that day. Now, do you want me to check that? You know, I can make two phone calls from here and find out. You want me to check if it was your back alimony? And where'd you get the money? Over $200 was taken from Mr. Luchenik. Is it the same money? I found it. But where did you find it? Where did you find it, Mrs. Stacy? Do you want to know the truth? Well, that's what we're here for. Well, it happened just the way I said it did. I saw the man come over the fence. And I watched him run across the yard. I didn't know then that anything had happened yet to Mr. Lucenic. 
And then I saw something lying on the ground. Over there where he jumped over the fence. I picked it up. It was all this money. $248, all stuffed in a money clip. Then I realized about Mr. Lucinic, and I ran over there. You said there was a money clip. Now, where is it? I didn't know what to do with it. I was afraid to keep it, and I was afraid to throw it away. Have you still got it? Now, where is it? He was dead. I'm, I'm really very sorry. That's all, Mrs. Stacy. We'll be in touch. She'll be out in a minute. She's getting dressed. All right. She'll be here in a minute. We got plenty of time. Rabida? <laughs> when a woman gets dressed. Rabida? Uh, I'll make you some coffee meanwhile. It won't take long. No, thanks. Mrs. Farrell? I was thrilled to death when you called. Good afternoon. Mrs. Farrell? Well, you said you had something interesting. Is it really interesting? We think so, yes. New evidence? Yes. Well, what is it? Mrs. Farrell, do you recognize this? Yes, yeah, that belongs to Frank. Are you sure? Oh, I'm positive. He made it. He made it in the shop. He made one for my husband, too. Paul, show them your money clip. Well, where did you find it? What does it mean? It means, Mrs. Farrell, that beyond any question of a doubt, your brother is guilty. That's not so. It was found in the backyard where he jumped over the fence. You tricked me. You came here to prove that he didn't do it. I came here to learn the truth, and the truth is that Frank wasn't here all afternoon. He was! Baby, let go, huh? I was home. I was sick. He gave me the soda. He watched the ball game the whole afternoon. The whole afternoon. He even gave me my medicine. What kind of medicine? For my nerves. Did you sleep any from the medicine? Well, maybe one minute, two minutes. I asked him for something a couple of times. He was always there. I'm sorry, Mrs. Farrell. He wasn't here. I don't believe it. He wouldn't kill anybody. Why would Frank want to kill anybody? He didn't want to kill him, Mrs. Farrell. He was just unlucky enough to find the man at home. I don't believe it. Not my brother. <laughs> Have you got any news? No bad news. We found your money clip in the young lady's backyard. Yeah. She wanted to keep the money, so she hid the clip. We've got it, and it's been identified as yours. That definitely puts you on the scene. So that's it. I was putting... I was putting the old man's cash into my clip when he walked in. I thought I had it with me when I ran out. I, I didn't know I dropped it. You told me you didn't go out. Oh, well, what did you want me to say? I did. You said you were there all afternoon. I know if you fell asleep, it wasn't my fault. But I was only asleep for a second. How can you tell how long you were asleep? You gave me an alibi and I used it. You made a liar out of me. Oh, now, you'd lie for your own brother, wouldn't you, if I asked you? And I didn't even have to ask you. 
<laughs> you can't blame me for trying. Ninety-nine years is a long time. Welcome back. It was a bit of a dirty trick that Sam played to get the truth out of the witness, even though I think he technically avoided lying to her. But it did bear fruit. As an episode, this is really important for the court of last resort. Watching the cases in this series, uh, I think one concern that people might have watching at home is that, yes, the court of last resort does get some uh, innocent people freed from prison, but is everyone they get released actually innocent? Or are these uh, men a bunch of naive, bleeding hearts who will help out anyone with a sob story and let killers go back out on the street? And this type of episode is selected because it allays those fears and shows that the men who made up the court of last resort were not naive. They didn't think that every conviction was wrongful. I think the way the reveal was handled was actually done rather well. You can see it in the face of the husband that he realizes uh, that somehow the evidence has come back that his wife's brother is guilty. You can just really tell from the look on his face. And the final scene drives home the overall thrust of the episode. We learn that the brother is not a wronged uh, man, but really a bit of a sociopath who doesn't care what he's put his sister through, doesn't care all the money that she and her husband have poured into this defense when he's been lying the whole time. It's a sad situation, but yeah, there are really uh, people who will put their family through that sort of thing. And this also just makes a nice twist on the typical episode of the series. So I hope you enjoyed this one as much as I did. That will do it for now.